Okay, let's talk about the basic building blocks of process costing. And you can see we have three here. One are called conversion costs. The second are called equivalent units of production. And the third are our inventory flow assumptions. So let's dig into each one of those a little bit with a little bit more detail. So when we talk about conversion costs, conversion costs, if you think about it, those we are calling our direct labor plus manufacturing overhead. So we're taking the raw materials and adding these conversion costs to convert the raw materials into a finished product. So again, conversion costs are our direct labor plus manufacturing overhead. And they are usually, but not always, incurred evenly throughout the production process. Now in today's economy, direct labor costs are becoming small when compared to materials and overhead costs. And the reason for this um, is automation. So as a consequence of the change in volume of direct labor costs, many companies are now just combining labor and overhead, and they're referring to them as total conversion costs. That is, these are the costs incurred to convert the direct materials into a finished good, and we will use this topic or this uh, title quite frequently as we go forward. Now units of production is another concept. When we are, have products that are in production, so they're in our work in process, um, we may have partially completed units that complicate the determination of a department's output for a given period and the cost that should be assigned to that particular output. So in order to uh, help us determine the costs assigned to a department during a particular period, we're going to use something called equivalent units. So equivalent units represent the amount of work that was done during a period in terms of fully completed units of production. So when work in process inventories consist of partially completed goods, we will use equivalent units to express the amount of work during the, done during the period in terms of fully completed units of output. Direct materials are often added at particular points during the process. For example, direct materials may be added at the beginning of the process or at the end or some percentage of the way through. So as stated previously, conversion costs are usually but not always incurred evenly through the production process. So here's an example of equivalent units. So if we have two half cups, these are in production, they're not yet completed, we add those together, that's the equivalent of having one full cup. Or in this case, 10,000 units that are 70% complete would be the equivalent to having 7,000 complete units. Here's a, a quick check just to again get you thinking in terms of equivalent units. So for the current period, Jones started 15,000 units and completed 10, leaving 5,000 units in process 30% complete. So what are the equivalent units of production for Jones for the period? Take a second, you can pause and, and work through that if you'd like. But the answer is 11,500. And the reason is we had 10,000 units that were started and completed. And then we have 5,000 units that are 30% complete. So you take the 5,000 times the 30%, that means you have 1,100 units, equivalent units, complete. Add that to the 10, and that will give you 11,500. Now when we're calculating equivalent units, there are a couple of inventory cost flow assumptions that can be used with the process. One is called FIFO. You may remember this from financial accounting, first in, first out, or the weighted average method. Now the weighted average method is typically assumed. The reason is because it's simpler and the differences between the two methods are usually immaterial. So the weighted average uh, assumption combines any beginning inventory costs and costs with the current period's units and costs to get a weighted average cost. Now we're not going to talk about FIFO. Uh, it's typically reserved for more advanced accounting courses. Um, but and again, so going forward we're going to assume we're using the weighted average method and that's what we're going to cover in this particular course. So when we use the weighted average method, we're going to make no distinction between work done in the prior period and work done in the current period. So we're going to blend together the units and costs from both the prior and the current period. And uh, we determine the cost per equivalent unit by dividing the cost for the period by the equivalent units of production. So how does process costing work using the weighted average assumption method?
So um, the weighted average assumption, as I just mentioned a second ago, combines the beginning inventory units and costs with the current period units and costs to get a weighted average cost. So to figure out the cost of making a completed product versus a partially completed product, use the following five-step process costing procedure. Step one, summarize the flow of physical units. Step two, compute output in terms of equivalent units. Step three, summarize total cost to account for. Step four, compute the cost per equivalent unit. And then step five, assign total cost to units completed and to units in ending work in process inventory. So let's go through each of those steps, um, giving you somewhat of a demonstration or an example here. So let's look at a company that manufactures swim masks. Step one, we're going to track the physical mu movement of swing mass into and out of the shaping department during the month. So if we've got the um, exhibit here, the first question to be addressed is how many physical units did the shaping department work on during the month? Now recall that they had no mass in beginning work in process. You can see that here is zero. So they started clean, like almost like a new company, new production process. And then during the month, they began to work on 50,000 mass, which you can see here. So they need to account for 50,000 mass at the end of the month. Keep that in mind. We need to account for 50,000 mass. That's going to be step one. Step two here helps us compute all of the department's output for the month in terms of equivalent units. So let us consider the 40,000 units that were completed and transferred out, which you'll see here, 40,000 units completed and transferred out. So if you think about it, in relation to direct materials and our conversion costs, direct labor and manufacturing overhead, those 40,000 units are 100% complete. So we will be 100% complete as far as uh, direct materials goes, and the same applies to conversion costs. Now, here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. This ending work in process. So this is what's still in process, 10,000 units. Now those 10,000 units are 100% complete with respect to direct materials, which is what we see here. But they're only 25% through the shaping process at the end of the month with regards to conversion costs. So the partially completed units have made it past the point where the direct materials are added and therefore have incurred the 10,000 equivalent units of direct materials, but the conversion costs are added evenly through the shaping process. So they're not quite complete uh, as far as that goes, only 25% complete, so only 2,500 equivalent units of conversion costs. 10,000 times 25% gives us 2,500 equivalent units. So our last step then is going to be to calculate the shaping department's output in terms of total equivalent units for the month. So we have to make calculate total separately for direct materials and conversion costs because they will differ in most circumstances. So to find the totals, we add the equivalent units of all mass work during the month. For direct materials, the total would be 50,000. We will add those two together. That gives us 50,000. Now, um, which is the sum of the 40,000 units completed and transferred plus the 10,000 units still in work in process. And we will follow the exact same step here with conversion costs. Add the 40,000 to the 2,500. That gives us 42,500 equivalent units completed with respect to the conversion costs. Let's look at step three here, which is to summarize the total costs to be accounted for. So um, these are the production costs that were associated with beginning inventory, if any existed, plus the production costs that were incurred during the month. So once again, we have to show separate totals for each of the two cost categories, direct materials and conversion costs. Because the department did not have any beginning inventory of partial units, the beginning balance and work in process account is zero. So our beginning is zero, you can see, and then the costs added during the month for each, direct materials and conversion costs. So we've got our cost to be accounted for. Step four is to compute the cost per equivalent unit. So the word per means divided by. So the cost per equivalent unit is the total cost to be accounted for divided by the total equivalent units.
for the period, as you see here. We must compute uh, a separate cost per equivalent unit for each cost category, meaning for both direct materials and conversion costs. So in addition to using the cost per equivalent unit in the five-step process, procedure, managers also use this information to determine how well they've controlled costs. So managers compare the actual cost per equivalent unit to the budgeted cost per equivalent unit for both direct materials and direct and conversion costs. If the cost per equivalent unit is the same or lower than budgeted, then the manager has successfully controlled costs. So in this particular case, the department incurred an average of $2.80 of direct materials cost and $1.60 of conversion cost to complete one equivalent unit. Okay, and then the final step here is to assign the total cost of units completed and to in wor ending work and process inventory. So the goal of step five is to determine how much of the department's 208,000 total cost should be assigned to the 40,000 completed units transferred out to the next department and the 10,000 partially completed units remaining in the department's ending work in process inventory. Now remember the 208,000 was the direct materials plus the conversion costs. Okay, so let's consider the 40,000 units completed and transferred out. We've got that right here. We learned that the company spent $2.80 on direct materials for each equivalent unit and $1.60 on the conversion costs for each equivalent unit. So the total cost for those units would be 40,000 times 280, 40,000 times 160, which um, added together becomes 176,000. Now let's move down to the units still in ending work in process. So we have 10,000 units of direct materials again at 280 per, so that's 28,000. And then these have 2,500 units of equivalent units of conversion costs at $1.60 per equivalent unit, so the conversion cost is 4,000. So the total cost of the 10,000 partially completed units in the department's ending work in process inventory will be the sum, those two added together, to give us $32,000. Now if we add the 176 to the 32, we get our total cost to be accounted for of 208. So we can see these are costs that need to be transferred out of work and process into the next step, and these 32,000 remain in work and process in that particular um, department. And that concludes the five steps needed to calculate the um, equivalent units of production.